Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Whale Nerds Podcast. This is episode three. My name is Slater, and I'm here with Eric and Caitlin. Hey, everyone. Hello. Hello. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> if you are wondering why we are doing episode three again, we had a little bit of a mishap with the audio file. There was a few skips in that podcast. I don't even know if you guys noticed it, but there was a missing Whoops. intro and uh, a couple other things. So what we're going to do is... We're going to change the subject, and we'll come back to that one on a later date. But today we thought we would talk about what? What were you thinking? Uh, what were we thinking? We were actually thinking about probably telling the people the difference between uh, our tooth whales and our baleen whales, otherwise known as... Mysticetes and odontocetes. Wow, you guys sound smart. Wow, we almost... We are smart. <laughs> if we could have just said it all said at the same time, it would have sounded fancy. Then they would have thought we were robots. We are. <laughs> so bear with us through as we're learning this whole podcasting thing thanks for sticking with us even though we're, we're redoing this is episode 3.1 there you go 3.1 three, three squared <laughs> <laughs> so um let's see let's start with the dolphins the tooth whales how many blowholes they have eric one <laughs> blowhole a single blowhole at the top of their head there's two types of odonocetes they fall into dolphins Wait. and oh. porpoises, and the main difference is their teeth. So dolphins have conical teeth, so they look like little sharp fangs. Porpoises have flat teeth. They also also call them spade shaped teeth. What I like to compare it to is your bottom teeth in your jaw. They're flat, kind of like those ones in the front, all around their mouth. And all tooth whales have one single blowhole. Yeah, on the outside, they do have two blowholes on the inside on their skull. All right, that's science. <laughs> <laughs> but it's cool because that's how they make sound. So the so, other blowholes part of their sound production inside their head. And what did they say that basically there was two blowholes at one point in time, and it slowly removed itself and kind of came went towards the front of the melon. It's like basically like your sinuses. So like we also have these paths um, where like like mucus and things move around in our face. And so they have something similar, but they're able to push air around inside their forehead. And that's how they channel sound out through the melon, which focuses the sound. So it's in a specific direction. So was that close? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah so, I, I thought I heard there was, yeah. it was originally technically like two blowholes, but they, yeah. didn't, they didn't need one. So it, it right. went towards their went echolocation. Went towards echolocation. Yeah. One becomes more like a closed loop to move air around in the head now. All right. And there's lots and lots of different types of dolphins. Yes. Um, as small as the vaquita or the harbor porpoise, mm -hmm. and then as big as the sperm whale or the, the orca. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. Sperm whales are pretty interesting because they are technically an odonocy, even though a lot of people think that they fall into the whale category. They are a toothed whale. They have one blowhole, and it's way at the front of their huge head. And then there's tons of arguments on whether a killer whale is a dolphin or a whale <laughs> from, people <laughs> that, from people that don't know. They're both. Exactly. So what happens when you let the whalers name things without like doing all the science first? <laughs> yeah. And then you got your baleen whales, which all have two blowholes on top of their head, mm -hmm. and the baleen plates, mm -hmm. which is like a little mustache hanging down from the roof of their mouth. Yep, that's what Mississippi roughly translates to, is the mustache in the mouth. That's kind of what it, what it means. Hey guys, you know what? You forgot the, the other differences between dolphins and porpoises. We can talk about that for a while. <laughs> Did you want to? Did you want to jump? Might as well, because I'm sure people are wondering: Is that the only difference with the blowholes and the uh, their, and the teeth? Their uh, <laughs> <laughs> their dorsal fins are also more of like a like a triangular shape, right? Yeah, exactly. The, the, yeah. the, the porpoises. And then there's the finless porpoise. Yeah. So <laughs> it's usually, complicated. Yeah. <laughs> It's kind of fun once you learn it, but it, it's pretty simple. I mean, uh, yeah, the dorsal fin is a major difference. The porpoise, it's usually very triangular, short, and squat. Um, on the dolphin, it's usually going to be more tall and a falcate, which is kind of like more swept back. Like uh, hooked. Yeah, hooked they both have one, one blowhole. Uh, we just talked about the teeth. Uh, dolphin usually have conical. Porpoise have like a more of a flat spade shape. Uh, also, one difference is, uh, it's not a physical difference, but it seems like age, lifespan yeah. yep. is a difference. <clears throat> yeah, like 20 years old is pretty old for most porpoise, but most dolphin species live 30 plus years, and some species live 70, 80, 90, maybe 100 years. So the porpoise, like, 
their lifespan generally shorter. There's a lot of argument, too, about whether they're evidence of um, convergent evolution or not. So did they come from the same ancestor on land? Mm -hmm. Or did they come from two different ancestors on land and then they developed a similar body style? For a long time, we thought it was convergent evolution, two separate land ancestors. But now it sounds like the phylogenists are going back the other way. They came from the same animal type on land and then differentiated in the sea. So do you think, what do you think, like, the closest from between, like, a dolphin and then a porpoise? What do you think the closest, like, relative they would have? On land, you mean? Well, like, in the water, like, where they split at, you think? Um, Like, would you say Pacific white side dolphin look pretty close to... Well, that brings up a good point. Because of their face, you know? The one difference we just still left out is, in general, they're thinking that porpoises usually have a more of a blunt rostrum. Yeah. Uh, but if you really look at the difference between a Pacific white side dolphin or a bottlenose, you can, you know, see it's pretty obvious right there. But, you know, we still classify a Pacific white side dolphin as a dolphin. And then your Rizzo's dolphins, same thing, you know, they have a really blunt face. And so there's a few people out there thinking that some of our <coughs> animals that specialize in probably eating cephalopods have developed yeah. more of a, a flatter <laughs> type of rostrum like porpoise. Probably because it makes it a little bit easier to inge- uh, to go after so cephalopods, squid, octopus, for example. You know, if Things you have a, with lots of legs. Yeah, if you got a long you beak or nose. Beak. Yeah, exactly. exactly. You got tentacles. And, but then you have beaked whales. Yeah. So. And they mostly only <clears throat> eat cephalopods in the deep sea, and they have. Yeah, but they a got beak. they got two teeth sticking <laughs> out of the front of their face, so they're they're ruthless and tooth. Well, they got <laughs> ruthless <two>. and toothless. <laughs> and I toothful. like it. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but generally the ones that also eat squid um, as a specialty don't have very many teeth. So you're kind of right with that with the beaked whales. They're kind of ruthless and toothless. Rizzo's dolphins don't have very many teeth either. Yeah. But the shape of the teeth is cone-shaped even in beaked whales as well, who also fall into the O'Donoghue category. Um, and beaked whales are kind of like porpoises and dolphins. They also have a unique set of <clears throat> structures, mostly around the face, where they have... It's just, it's kind of hard to describe it other than it looks like a beak. Like a bottlenose dolphin, but with even more of an intense shape of a melon. Like more bulbous head, but still that thick, stout beak. They, that, look, they look a lot different. They look yeah. pretty different. Yeah, and then they're them. big. And so they, you know, you can see how whalers call them whales, but they're whales with a face like a bottlenose dolphin. Kind of, it's, it's like anything over 25, uh, 22, <laughs> they start calling them whales. Yeah, pilot whales, false yeah, killer it, whales, killer. Yeah, all the blackfish have whale in their name. Yeah. So melon-headed whales. Not in their scientific <laughs> name. No. Just in their. Just in their common name. Yeah. Yes. Um, so yeah, it's kind of interesting. We're still trying to hash it all out. The hard part about trying to find fossils for a lot of these animals is they may be buried in the deep sea or you know not complete skeletons, and so. Trying to figure out how they're all related is still an up and coming part of the science. But if they're buried in the deep <coughs> sea, what are those? What are the things that eat the bones on the bottom? What are they called? Oh, the worms. Yeah, yeah. yeah. there's the, a type of worm that actually will eat the the bones of. Uh, there's a name of it though, isn't it? Is it, a poly, whales. is it a type of polychaete worm or what is it? Um, I forgot exactly. I think some guys actually over at Scripps described them. Yeah, not really. I don't remember much about them, but yeah, yeah I remember checking out whale falls, and you know they thought. Once the whale was down to bones, it was pretty much done. But no, there is a type of worm out there that uh, uh, that will, for decades, uh, feed on those bones. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Actually, I heard a fun fact at the um, Exploratorium. They do like a Thursday night science after dark thing up in San Francisco. And they think now that whale falls, they put it really interestingly. Like they think gray whales live 50 to 75 years. And they also think that their skeleton supports a whale fall deep sea ecosystem for 50 to 75 years so they like double their lifespan with their contri- contribution to the nutrient cycling of the deep sea which is pretty cool wow so they're basically their body feeds things for about 70 years after right mm-hmm. yeah they've already sunk to the bottom it's pretty nuts yeah pretty interesting subject what's a bummer was uh you know the aquarium of the pacific used to have a an exhibit just dedicated to um, whale falls, but unfortunately, I think it actually got taken out because of the remodeling. But yeah, it was only the few exhibits that actually, you know, talk strictly about that because it's such an important little little mini uh, ecosystem mm-hmm. down on the bottom of our sea floors. Mm-hmm. Speaking of fossils and bones and stuff, there's a place 
on, um, in Friday Harbor in the San Juan Islands and the Whale Museum. Is that what it's mm-hmm. called? The Whale yep. Museum? Mm-hmm. Yep. And they have skeletons of orcas, gray whales. I think they have a minke whale. Mm-hmm. They have common dolphin. They have lots of skeleton structures there, and they're really cool. I, would, I highly recommend going to that, that area and checking all that stuff out. I really like looking at, like, O'Donoghue skulls, so any toothed whale skull, because if you look at it straight on from, like, your opposite of it, it's it, you almost think it's crooked because it's asymmetrical, and that's how they get directionality with their hearing and their communicating. And the killer whale's pectoral fins are huge. Yeah. Like, it was a male. It's a male that's in there. And yeah. It's in, I'm pretty sure it was... I want to say it was a transient, so it was a huge whale. Yeah, big peck fins. Looks like big hands. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Miss Deceits, are we are we good with the dolphin and porpoise? Yeah, go for okay. it. So, back to the Miss Deceits. Wait. It's mustache <clears throat> whale. Since we're talking about Miss Deceits and it's gray whale season, tell them how they're the only whale that feeds in the mud. Yeah, so there's there's three main methods of, of Miss Deceit feeding. There's the lunge feeders... There's the skim feeders or ram feeders and the, the ones that dig in the sand. And gray whales are the only ones left in their category that dig in the sand as their main way of finding food. Um, so it's kind of interesting. Their baleen is pretty short and coarse. Um, and they, they go down on their side. Most of them are right-handed, so they go down on their right side in the sand. And they open their mouth once they're down there to create like negative pressure to create suction. And they suck in the... A sand the amphipods in the sand which they want and the water and then out the other side of their mouth is the sand is getting blown out the other side basically as they're chomping and wiggling <laughs> in the bottom and they make these little pits it's actually cool you could kind of see it from a clip it's like grazing from a right they leave like and you can see yeah they, they leave like yeah there's like mounds, all these right? little yeah all these yeah. little holes in the sand you can actually uh, according to a talk by uh, Cascadia they're actually you can actually see some of those pits created by them by a certain population of, uh, I shouldn't say population yet, <laughs> a certain uh, few uh, gray whales that actually go to the northern Puget Sound yeah. uh, and actually eat ghost shrimp. And uh, Google Maps, if you go in there, you can actually oh, yeah. see those Dave pits. Oh, yeah, Dave Cade has a shot. Yeah. Sh- oh, talk. screenshot? Yeah, he has I a shot that. of that. Yeah. Off topic, but <laughs> I love looking up those coordinates and there's like, you know, the elephants. You can see elephants in mm-hmm. Africa. There's, mm-hmm. there, I mean, there's so much stuff to look at yeah. from above, but it's really cool. So when you watch a gray whale feeding like that, sometimes I've seen it from shore in Oregon because they feed off the Oregon coast um, in the summertime. It's like this muddy mess at the surface. So you see this yeah. whale kind of wiggling around and then this muddy mess. And then what happens when they write themselves is they're sifting all that sand out, but the baleen is catching all the amphipods inside and then they swallow it whole. Um, and so that's kind of a unique way to use the baleen is because it has to be able to set up to sift through sand and water, not just water. So that's a little bit different challenge than the rest of the mysticetes. And just a little ways back, you said that the gray whales are mainly right-sided and one of the ways this is one of my favorite facts I actually just put this on my Instagram about a week ago and one of the ways they know that gray whales are either right-sided or left-sided is by the way they feed gray whales will actually have um, their barnacles or whale ice and stuff scraped off the side of the face that they feed on Mm -hmm. and that's how they know that they're right-sided or left-sided yep exactly there are a few that are left-sided um is it similar proportion to human population? Similar to humans, yeah. Yeah, yeah similar to the proportion so, of humans that are left-handed. I'm right-handed. I'm right-handed. Me too. <laughs> We're st- statistically insignificant right now. We follow the majority. <laughs> uh. So the rest of the Mississippi's, the ram feeders are right whales and bowhead whales. So they skim at the top. They constantly swim with their mouth open. Um, That's crazy. Or at least I've open never a seen. I've bit. never seen any footage of them feeding. I don't think there's not a lot out there, but there is some, um, and it's pretty trippy to watch because they have like this pretty big gap in the front of their mouth, whereas other baleen whales, the baleen comes almost all the way up right to the end. Um, but there's a pretty big gap, and then they have this huge tongue, and it just like creates this big funnel to siphon the water through the mouth and then it comes out the side of the plates. And that's why they have those really weird looking jaws that are big, bow shaped, and the really tall baleen because they're filtering I was say, constantly. So it comes in and goes right out the side. Yeah, so exactly. That's why the kind of like long. how when a fish has its mouth open and then things go across the gills. The gill rakers, yeah. Kind of like that as far as like the flow of the water, but quite a different. Those are two whales I really want to see. 
Me too. Yeah, I definitely see bowhead or a right whale. Bucket list. Yeah, you can see the, the southern right whales in Chile. Mhm. Mhm. Yep. Yeah, I want to okay. go down there. I had a friend that was just down there doing some sort of research. Yeah, their their um their population is recovering a lot better than the northern counterparts, the Pacific and the Atlantic ones. Um, and you can see them in New Zealand or Australia. Which one is it? I think Australia. I know they're in Australia. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think Australia is another place you can see. Oh, is it? I think it's like Western Australia yeah, or but something. They, they see them. Oh, yeah. no. Mm. They, they show not, up in New Zealand, too. Yeah. yeah. But um, everywhere but here. <laughs> in Monterey. Well, it's well, kind we of got, a sad yeah. story. Yeah. We might. You yeah, never know. Yeah. <laughs> Someday, you know, like the news in La Jolla catching a gray whale. Maybe yeah. episode, right episode 3.2. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Our North Pacific, sir. I think we talked about that one the first episode, how rare they are. Yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah, it's pretty interesting. A lot of the whale watch boats in Monterey, actually the baleen they have is from a bowhead or a right whale. And most of the pieces that I've ever worked with on deck are taller than me. Just one plate is taller than me. Yeah. I mean, I'm five foot they four. Get, I'm not that tall. I saw those on the um, catamaran. I think they yeah. get, what, close to 13, 18 feet, something. They can be very it's, like, it's, I know it's over 10 feet, long. yeah. I've had a yeah. What? Pieces at the feet? aquarium. Yeah. Yeah, oh, 10 feet plus. kind of like curve at the bottom. I mean, yeah, in the their front, mouths, they kind of curve. Well, the front ones are a lot shorter than the ones towards the back as the, they match like the bowing Where of they the jaw. Out. Yeah, exactly. But the head of these whales, I mean, if you look at the old photos from the whaling days of people standing next to bowheads and right whales, I mean, that's a... Just their head is like it's twice the really size tall. height of yeah. a person. Paul Nicklin has one next to the bowhead whale, I believe. Yeah. And then Brian Scary has one next to the uh, right whale. Yeah, I mean, you could stand... I could... What I tell people is when I hold the baleen, I'm like, I could stand up inside this whale's mouth. With it closed. <laughs> and then the roar quals are the last, the lunge feeders are the last type, which are the most common, especially here in California. That's what we see most often. Humpback whales, minke whales, fin whales, blue whales, say whales, British whales, they all fall into that. So they all have those accordion style muscles, those pleats on the throat that go from their chin to their belly button. They open a huge mouthful, take it in, and then they push it back out and strain it out after they've taken a big gulp. And those pleats are really cool. Yes. How they use them to, I mean, basically it slows them down. Yeah. It's like as a giant well, As well, it holds all the fish in. Yeah. Or all the water in. And then is it the nerve? What did the Goldbogen Lab publish? Was it last year? The, those nerves are very, oh, very stretchy. Yeah. yeah they said yeah. it was like the craziest material, like stretchiness of yeah, material. Yeah. 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 It's like nothing else, on, no other animal on earth has something that stretchy that's a nerve in that book spying on whales i just started listening to it science i'm just saying, <laughs> I'm just saying there was some science in there <laughs> um actually the goldbogen lab at hopkins which is just down the street from where we are here um they do a lot of the biomechanics so they calculate what it takes for a whale to do those kind of behaviors and um they said that any whale that's more than 60 feet long doubles its body volume when it takes in all that water to fill its throat pleats. So really, really big humpbacks and then pretty much anything bigger than a humpback is doubling its body volume in water just by opening that mouth. Yeah, there's a lot of amazing uh, new things they've been figuring out. That lab, I do know, I think they upped the, the volume of uh, the blue whale's mouth. I remember hearing uh, one of their grad students over there saying that they just measured it about, what, 21,000 gallons or so? We, we used to I always say was... about 17 or so, but uh, yeah. I was like, wow, keep on hearing that figure uh, figure go up. So Well, they're getting, I feel like drones and aerial surveys of these animals has really changed the game with how well you can calculate that, and their tag data also is getting really good from underwater on the whale. Yeah, it seems like, I don't know why, but it seems like the way whales feed and what they're feeding on it seems to be a big topic nowadays. Uh, kind of jumping back to the gray whales, another thing I learned back from another Cascadia talk is we always assume gray whales are feeding off the bottom and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. if the food's there, oh. there is the capability of them uh, going. They've been seen uh, eating mice, shrimp, uh, yeah. you know, and, and krill. So they will take advantage of uh, whatever's out there. Yeah. And even like our humpback whales, not this population over here, as of yet, I don't know if they do it, but I do know the ones back east will often uh, go to the bottom of the seafloor if those mm -hmm. sand eels are over there. Yep. They've noticed that they've seen a lot of abrasions on the, the side of their mouths, and it turns out they will actually kind of head to the bottom too. So yeah. a lot of things that we 
thought they won't do, you know, these animals might do sometimes. Kind of like those days when people ask you, do blue whales breach? And then <laughs> next thing you know, you see it happen. I still don't think they breach. Like, they, that was they come out of the water. A blue but whale like, version of a breach. No, I know. It's crazy. Because, <laughs> like, I always think, when you think of a breach, I just think, like, three quarters of the way of the water yeah. and turn. But, but no, was, no, like, more no, than half the whales And fin the whales. Water. I mean, they, they have pictures of fin whales breaching, That's too. That's true, especially in the That Atlantic. blue whale. You guys had the blue whale breach, right? I wasn't on the boat. You were, I was, was in the there. shop, and they were freaking out. You got a photo. You kind of got a photo, <laughs> right? uh, We actually had a passenger to get yeah. some yeah, pretty good photos. Yeah. And what's funny is that day. the good breaches happened before we realized what it was really happening. And, you know, myself and the captain were in a wheelhouse going, breach, you know? And then it was happening multiple times, but the more we stared at, like, well, hey, this is a really, really bulky whale, you know? It didn't look as, <laughs> as streamlined as a, uh, a humpback as we got closer. And this thing, before we realized what was going on, breached multiple times. I mean, uh, in so total, crazy. probably close to, you know, about eight times or so. Uh, luckily, a passenger at the bow was, you know, smart enough to take pictures from a distance. And then when we got to it, we realized, oh, yeah, you know, that was a blue breaching. And these were, yeah, you know, the, the, not a chin slap, you know, not just spy hopping. It was... You know, two thirds of the whale. Uh, those first few breaches were about two thirds of the whale coming out of the water. And then the first time I saw one breach was actually with uh, my buddy, the other Eric, <laughs> out of Long Beach, uh, over by the oil rigs. Saw, yeah, blue whale come out of the water there too. So, you know, you're out in the water long enough, you'll you'll see some of those things that people tell you won't happen. Well, might happen. <laughs> what I like to tell people about whales is, just when you think you got them figured out, they prove you wrong. Yeah, I, I remember this one day. We were watching, like, I don't know, f five to seven fin whales. And they were going 15-plus knots, no problem. We couldn't mm -hmm. keep up with them mm -hmm. on the on the regular whale watch boat. Uh, there was a Zodiac keeping up with them. They ended up going, like, from Laguna Beach all the way out between Catalina and Palos Verdes. Wow. Like, they went far. And a fishing boat saw them out there. And they just kept going. Yeah. So it was, and they were just, por they were, like, porpoising. Yeah. Yeah, like they the get their entire chin time. way up. They weren't, yeah. like, yeah, they got their chins out of the water, yeah. you know. But like, yeah, I've woo. seen them do that, too. We lost, we couldn't keep up with them one time. We tried to follow them. When you're not keeping up with a 60-plus foot, what easily, you know, like. The greyhounds of the sea. Yeah, I, I've <laughs> actually seen, yeah, the fin whales, one whale that I've actually seen porpoise out of the water before and that was yeah back in long beach also so i saw them they do it Monterey after some killer whales harassed them for a few minutes and they were out of there and speaking of uh fin whales caitlin you might have saw this too um i think some of our southern california listeners might be interested in this it turns out that we might have like a resident population of fin whales I don't know if you read that poster that was different, out there different than the um gulf of california once. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something that stays here stateside, not you know down down yeah. towards Mexico. So do you think they go all the, way, the same ones that are here in Monterey or no? Well, that's one thing I was wondering because I that? actually got the uh, you know the information of the person who did the work, and I think it'd be interesting to kind of you know get some of our photos of that person to see if they match up. Yeah, because I always felt like, well, I mean I don't know, but they kind of just follow the food around, so they could be here or. Yeah, so I mean, so so little is known about fin whales because they spend most of their time offshore that I think we're really just barely starting to tease these things out. Um, actually, some of the books that you'll read about that describe fin whales, like if you have a marine mammal encyclopedia or something like that, they even speculate that fin whales may shift their breeding location based on prey, like based on food availability, and they communicate that to each other kind of like on the fly because we don't, we really don't know. We don't know where, where is their the breeding heck they location. Go. We don't know. Exactly. That's just like, that's, that's so crazy to me. There's also, I feel like they are always seeing fin whales in the Sea of Cortez. Yes, like I, see, I feel a, like there's there a, a population, and that yeah, that's yeah. a particular population that they think yeah, is uh, that's why I was sticking around there. Eric, if they think there's an overlap between no, those two subgroups, completely different. Yeah, they think this yeah. is a, a strictly a Southern California. A couple years uh, ago, at one of the Marine Mammal, I think it was the 15th year 2015 Marine Mammal Conference, there was a poster that said there is definitely a resident population in the Sea of Yeah, I'm surprised you didn't see it. Yeah, it's, it's right here, isn't it? During the poster section, yeah. but it was pretty interesting. Yeah, it's right maybe it's California, like a. So. I'd like, to get, sector. I'd like Could to get be. them some photos of uh, what we see yeah. up here in the, the central yeah, coast. For sure. Okay, so thinking about d jumping backwards towards the baleen again. Um, not only does the baleen kind of tell you what whales specialize in, because each whale's, 
each species baleen is unique based on what they feed on. Um, it also provides a record of the whale's life. And some species you can get up to 10 to 15 years worth of information about, you know, stress the whale received. Um, sometimes even like toxins in the ocean get um, kind of bonded into the baleen. And then there's other ways that um, you can track those changes longer through, through whale earplugs too. So we're trying to, as science is figuring out all these changes in the ocean and who's gonna make it and who's survived thus far, um, it's kind of interesting to watch how they're, how they're documenting that. Baleen is one way, but also uh, whale earwax is another way. And that, you just sent me an article, I think, while I was down south. Yeah, yeah, so just the baleen and the earwax kind of lay down in layers the same way as rings on a tree. Um, and the earwax actually stays in the, is documented from day one of the whale's life until the day it dies. Whereas baleen keeps growing, it breaks, it frays off in the end. The earwax, you get a complete life history of the whale and a lot of what gets stored in there that scientists are using um, to assess stress in whales or like how the whale's life is going is cortisol. So with tree rings, you know, you look and you're like, oh, well, when the ring's thin, there wasn't a lot of water. When the rings are thick, there was a lot of water, there was a lot of growth. For the earwax, if there's not a lot of cortisol, then things are going good. There's not a lot of stress, because um, even humans have this. Cortisol is a hormone that gets released in our blood and our fat um, when we're stressed, and it also gets stored in earwax, in whales. And so if there's a lot of cortisol in the layers, then it was very, very stressful. And um, you can see in some types of whales, and depending on which specimens you get, you can see that onset of the Industrial Revolution, you can see the whaling era. You can see different toxins that were up, out in the ocean, like pesticides. Um, I don't know if they found DDT in Yeah, actually, wax. the a um, lot of people who've been studying uh, chemicals have looked into different animals, uh, and they've noticed that any animal that comes close to California uh, gets a certain signature of chemicals, a combination of chemicals that ends up in their body. It's I think they just re simply refer it to... I refer it as the uh, California signature. I think they were doing some like uh, uh, testing with some animals down in San Diego, and uh, yeah, they noticed you can kind of figure out an animal's migration pattern or how much time it's spent in a certain area by the amount of certain chemicals that are in their body because they know where these chemicals kind of have been coming from and where they're concentrated. And California's coastline has you know, has a unique signature that will you know show up in an animal's body. Mm -hmm. And as the oceans get noisier, as, the con as humans continue to use the ocean in different ways, um, they're seeing more and more a trend towards just higher background levels of cortisol in whale um, bodies, in their blubber, in their blood, and, and then in their earwax. Um, so it's definitely something to think about. It's, a, it's kind, of, kind of sad, kind of a bummer. We're, we're stressing whales out at a new threshold because of all the noise we make in the ocean. But it is interesting to know that after a whale dies, if you can extract that, you can get a complete life history of the whale from something as bizarre as earwax. <laughs> Do you think it's for sure the noise? Or could it be that, like, there's not as much food? Yeah, it could be that, too. Yeah, not as much things, food, yeah. warmer water. A lot um, of, I mean, when I don't eat, I get stressed, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Less food causes more stress, so more cortisol will show yep. up. So, yeah. Yep being chased after by, you know, someone with a harpoon, <laughs> the amount of a bow or boat obviously going to make uh, cortisol go up. So that's what's causing that signature to show up in these animals. I wonder if like one traumatic day could show up. Um, definitely in the blubber like and in the blood, but I think probably for it to show up in the earwax, it'd have to be weeks to months. Of like that stress. whale that got hit, you know, the calf mm -hmm. over the summer, which ended up being okay, we saw a couple yeah, months later. Yeah. Um, do you think like that's something you could try? You could read like a stress from that day. Maybe it depends on the I guess the severity of the injuries. If it took a long time to get over the injuries, like six months or something, yeah, it probably would show up in that layer. Uh, but definitely, if you were to test that little calf's blubber for the first few weeks after the collision, the cortisol would be very high. All right. Science. Yeah. So <laughs> earplugs not only. Kind of tell you the animals, you know, stress level, health, but uh, also age. Yeah. And yeah. So. Yeah, you can age, you can age whales through um, earwax, which is I think going to be interesting as we try and figure out how to maybe age whales 
with biopsy samples so they're trying to figure out if there's like a way to run the genetics if you can tell how old a whale is and so the earwax can kind of provide some ground truthing to that i mean you can't extract earwax from a living whale yeah. you do have to wait till the whale's yeah. dead but to they get were that. saying that the the wax obviously wax is such a soft substance you know it doesn't hold up as well so you know your readings from it uh especially age are going to be obviously a guesstimate not exact mm. yeah mm-hmm. do you think that maybe snot bot maybe Can yeah you get some age from that yeah they're just from say, the blow holes? yeah running the running the genetics of the cells that are coming off when the whale's exhaling is is one way it's not very accurate there's yet. definitely stuff coming out of those blow holes we saw that yeah <laughs> definitely a lot <laughs> of i uh, saw that happen yeah a lot of uh different things <laughs> coming out of there in fact uh we used to always say when you see a blow you know or a spout that uh, it's, it's a number of things it's a little bit of uh, seawater obviously it's going to be a little bit of vapor um, and also a lot of it's going to be mucus and also uh, some of it uh, including in that you know in that mucus is going to be a, a little bit of bacteria so mm-hmm. that's why the, these uh, snot aka blow samples are so important because you can still get cortisol from it you can mm-hmm. get a yep. big snapshot of the animal's health because some of that bacteria might be uh, you know uh, something that's obviously uh, bad bacteria, and you can, might be able to tell if the animal has an illness or not. But there's a lot that these whales leave for us that can actually give us uh, a, uh, a health assessment of the animal, and even their their feces, their poop. Oh man, that's a we can do another whole another talk on that. That will give you <laughs> stress level. That will give you. Um, uh, you can even get uh, determine if the animal is a male or female from mm-hmm. that. Uh, you can even tell if the animal's pregnant. Just kind of like a, a stool sample that's left by, you know, your dog <laughs> that your vet usually requests. Or, hey, even us, some humans sometimes will give you a great uh, health assessment. Yeah, and um, have you ever had to wash whale snot off your glasses? Off of my camera. Yeah, off your <laughs> camera. It's my gnarly. Drone. I tell people, like, if we happen to have, like, whale snot drift over to us from the boat or we get, like, a friendly whale or something, I'm like, wait to wipe your glasses off until you get to soap and water because smearing it around (laughs) with your shirt is not going to help because it really is mucusy. It's pretty gross. Speaking of stuff coming out of the blowholes, I I filmed that uh, CA-199, that lone male that went down the coast. Mm -hmm. And I have a video of him launching like a big old oh, lot yeah. of snot or mucus. <laughs> I remember watching that. <laughs> it's just that. like, I did it in like 60 frames. So it was just like, <laughs> splash. And you could see it going out. Yeah, and landing. And sitting in the water. I remember you sent it to me and you were like, dude, look at this. She collected it. He blew a booger out. <laughs> <laughs> you think it was just snot or something? Yeah, probably. Just coughed it up. I thought maybe something was like right, you know, resting like right where the, the water kind of rests on top of their blowhole. I but know, I, I was like, that's a lot. That'd be, yeah. that'd be that happens weird. sometimes. You never know. I've actually seen a sea nettle get launched into <laughs> yeah, another, I could see that. another atmosphere by uh, a humpback <laughs> whale once. This is the funniest thing I've ever seen. I don't know. This video Slater had that definitely looked like mucus to me. God, that's my next goal is to get a sea nettle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was actually our buddy Shane, and it, he said he has got a, got a <laughs> blurry picture of it, but it was, those of us who saw it, it was the most comical thing I've ever seen. I've, I've never, seen... Was that here in Monterey? Oh, yeah, yeah, it was Monterey. here in Monterey. I've never seen something get launched so high. <laughs> I've seen by a whale. birds like flying over a whale and not expecting it to breathe, and the bird gets flown off, blown off course. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I have so many pictures of, of like, you can see that because the bird will, like, stop and, like, spread yeah, its wings back yeah. and try to, like, stop its yeah. tracks. Yeah, I've seen but pe- I think, pelicans get hit. I think the best all-time <laughs> snot story of them all is has to be when uh, me and Slater were on the uh, oh, yeah. ACS trip that one oh, year. Oh, yeah. Uh, this lady, we had a friendly whale for... Three ladies, that was a yeah. big blow, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> The whole bow, honestly. Yeah. That we had a friendly whale for well over 30 minutes. It, it, it actually left and then came back to the boat twice. And there was another whale that was actually hanging out just off, like 100 yards off from that one, just like, what are you doing? <laughs> and his friend's just rubbing himself on the front of our boat. And these three ladies were, were like, just enjoying the, the view. And... It exhaled. When they forgot you should not ever, ever put your head directly over the blowholes of a humpback whale. That's how close I'm, the whale was. So I'm going to Baja this next month, and I'm like, 
I'm probably going to get covered. Yeah, you too. actually have to time that. Uh, when I went, yeah, you, you have to learn how to time that. Uh, some people will take those storm shields with them, but you'll realize they'll be more more cumbersome to, to actually, you know, adjust, you know, your camera and stuff like that. So just just time it really well. Yeah, you're going to get hit in Baja a lot by Great Will Snot. Yeah. <laughs> That's fine. That'll be Slater's podcast yeah there's some people it's a dream come true yeah off of your camera i'll I'll, I'll write a book i don't know if you guys heard about the nikon story but yeah i got snotted on a lot Uh, i think my first year in baja and it actually uh caused some issues to my camera so i took it to a uh, a place to fix it and the first thing out of the guy's mouth when i you know when he uh, wanted to tell me what's going on my phone, he's like, "Have you been around salt water?" Aliens. <laughs> and I was like, "Uh, couldn't lie to him." I was like, "Yeah, that's all salt water and whale snot you got there." He's like, <laughs> "He's like, oh, that's what it is." So, yeah, be careful with your equipment. Yeah, hey, that whale snot will really get you. It's definitely a unique substance, and it, their breath can smell too, and that's actually from the Ooh. bacteria population in their lungs, which is how the Snot Bot Project. All- really came about was to assess that I go I, go I try to go live on Instagram while I'm on the boat or Facebook and it's funny because they'll hear everybody be like ew what is that? like what's that smell <laughs> and and if you're downwind from a humpback or especially a minky whale or mo- actually most of the baleen whales pretty is, much any baleen yeah they all yeah. smell I don't think I've ever smelled a blue whale I smell blue whales I just graze I you know obviously because they're probably uh Gray whales are smelly. Usually, yeah. All right. I haven't smelled them, and I've been right next to them. What do you think it smells like on three? One, two, three. Rotten broccoli. Poop. Yeah, rotten broccoli. <laughs> As- rotten asparagus, rotten broccoli. That's what I tell people. I just like saying poop. <laughs> Jesus. Thanks for that contribution, Eric. It smells like rotten. It smells like you're going past a farm. Like Brussels sprouts and broccoli yeah. that are rotten. But this yeah. smell is helpful for those of you who have been well watching uh, – Especially out here towards the central coast, man. There's days we cannot see an animal, but yeah, we'll hear them and smell them sometimes. Mm-hmm. So yeah. that smell does give us a clue that they're out there. When it was foggy this summer, sometimes I would tell the captain, like, "I smell a whale. We have to be close." Yeah, that's happened many <laughs> times. Actually, I mean, yeah, we found so many. That's how you find whales when it's foggy. Smell them, hear them. Uh, we've even, uh, yeah, one day yeah, we them. actually followed those sea lions too, especially during the, the summer when you get. So much feeding going on out here. Yeah. Yeah, one day we did that, and that worked. We had a foggy day with John, um, I want to say this last summer. Yeah. And we had, like, we ended up seeing, like, four or five blue whales. It was completely, Peace-y. like, yeah, it was just fog everywhere you looked. And we just stopped the boat, and we listened. We, we went to an area where we knew, you know, they the whales had been, be, like, yeah. off the canyon's edge and stuff. And then we listened, and we ended up finding three or four blue whales or four or five blue whales. A couple of years ago, it was foggy and smoky when we had a big fire here in Big Sur. And the whales were right outside Point Pinos. And so we would just drive out there and just stop. And there was so many days in a row where we had to listen for the whales that you could start to tell the species apart based on the sound of the inhale. You'd be like, oh, that's a small inhale. That's a humpback. Oh, that's a huge. It sounds like a cave filling up with air. That's a blue whale. Yeah, it was pretty pretty cool or like a wind tunnel yeah yep. yeah and speaking of whales making noise uh, where we live here in monterey we have a, a hydrophone that's out in the ocean in the middle of our canyon here what is it like i don't know how many, 10 miles out well it's about i think it was 18 miles out 18. but the cord itself is over 30 miles long because it has to follow along the edge of the canyon doesn't even make sense because <laughs> well, it has to go so deep because it's, it's not know, it's but... not going straight yeah, yeah. it's going, kind of like following the edge of the canyon i, I just yeah, looked like it up last out. night but it's, it's a, i think it wants to say 18 miles out pretty much out towards the, the mouth of the uh, bay and it's um on what, the north is side. it three thousand feet uh, something like that. Yeah. It's run by Mimbari, which stands for the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, and it's out at a location in the canyon called Smooth Ridge. And it is a stationary hydrophone. 3, yeah, and it looks like in their description on their YouTube channel, it is 3,000 feet down, 1,000 meters down. Um, and it's cool because it live streams to YouTube through Mimbari's YouTube channel. So we get to listen to our whales. No, Eric listens, and then he calls us and lets us know when something good is on there. Yeah, I put it on in the we, shop by myself. Yeah, we, we talked about earlier how, you know, obviously there's days that, man, 
the weather's bad, your trips got canceled, you can't work, or you just can't get on the trip you booked, you know, but you really need your well fixed, uh, your well fixed, you don't want to go outside, this uh, hydrophone, uh, once again set up by Embari, or known as the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, is available to the general public on YouTube, and I think a few of you out there might have clicked on it, I know I try to post on there, and when I do, I'll wake everyone up in the middle of the night, like Caitlin and, uh, and Slater and my friend Kate. <laughs> let them know what I'm hearing, but we've heard things like sperm whales, uh, beaked whales, then humpback whales, dolphins a lot, dolphins, dolphins and yeah. sea lions even sometimes. Oh, I was gonna say that's another one. Yeah, a lot. especially late at night, you hear them all barking. Yeah, above water, they also make a lot of crazy sounds. Yeah, too. and I think it was even with you. Remember that one night we almost thought we heard like gunshots or repeated oh banging? yeah and we thought that maybe yeah we, we talked to some people and we thought maybe they were seal bombs seal so like, bombs yeah. possibly yeah. Mm -hmm. a lot of times commercial fishermen and, and they're allowed to they throw seal bombs in the water so that the sea lions scare away from the nets yeah which yep. may or may not work sometimes yeah, yeah. they yeah. probably get used if to you guys don't know yeah we uh here in the monterey area have uh the best uh kind of uh opportunity for fishermen to load up on uh market squid yeah. so when they're out here the the uh, sea lions want to join in and the commercial fishermen actually use these little uh, firecracker like little uh, objects that uh, are used to scare away the uh, sea lions. They just simply light them, throw them overboard, and they sink down a few feet and boom. And yeah, we'll hear them. Yeah, sometimes, actually, a lot of the time, pretty much every day, you can hear a cargo ship on the hydrophone too as they're approaching or mm. leaving the port of San Francisco. It's so like it's a rumble. A, yeah, a really low rumble. Sometimes it's also nice on the YouTube channel, it shows a spectrogram so you can see. If there's a sound, you can also see the pickup of it, and there's like a secondary low line. That's the cargo ship usually going by. And uh, we did mention the species um, of animals you can hear. Some of you might have heard me say blue whale, and for those of you who are big old uh, acoustic nerds, are probably like, "That's not possible, Eric. How can you hear a humpback on the same you know frequency as you're hearing uh, blue whales?" Well, what Mbari does is they actually, even though the the stream is live. Uh, on their end, they actually delay it. Uh, let's see, delay it about 20 minutes. They actually way, have a way of processing it where you can hear uh, some of those frequencies, like the a few of those blue whale calls are at. You know, so you, they modify it so you can hear it. So that's one neat opportunity this uh, hydrophone offers us. What is it like? Uh, blue whale has a D call. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they have. There's a couple. I know there's a couple. There's a couple, yeah. I forgot I think which that one, this one of them is. It sounds really crazy. You yeah. Can, it's, and if you go on their website or, yeah, on their website, you can actually go and look through some of the ones they have recorded yeah, over they the have years. Sounds. Yes, yeah. yeah. And they have like humpbacks with dolphins or they have humpbacks alone. Mm -hmm. um, if sper you can hear the clicks of the sperm whale. Mm -hmm. In the cool fall, stuff. we get humpback whales singing too, which is yeah. cool. And we, you found, you called me one night with. Eric called me one night with the humpback singing on the hydrophone. Yeah, some you nights it's it. amazing. It's it's just like putting on a concert or something like that. So we we all never a get nerd concert. Yeah, a lot of us <laughs> never get never get tired of listening to this thing. So if you haven't uh, checked it out, uh, how would you search it? Well, it's under uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, and they have in parentheses uh, Embari, and it's uh, labeled Deep Sea Sound Recordings Live Stream. So. Uh, click on that. I know it goes down temporarily sometimes, and then it pops back up in a day or so. But yeah, this is a neat opportunity for you folks who need your well fix. Even though you got, even if you're landlocked, you'll still have the opportunity to hear these creatures that we're talking about. The other day, we could hear the rain on it too. Remember, we were all oh, yeah. off, and you could hear the rain on the hydrophone. Yeah, yeah. that's pretty neat. When I look it up, I usually just go to YouTube.com and then just type M B A R I. And oh, then, it shows and, up that way. Yeah. Okay, and, then, and then you can, because they also have they have the the live recording, and then they also have videos recorded on their channel, uh, because they also do like submarines and uh, or ROVs and stuff mm -hmm. here in the canyon, and they have some of the you know the fish that you guys see on Blue Planet, the deep sea fish like the yeah. the angler fish or stuff yep. like that. They have that all recorded here in Monterey Bay um, from the Monterey Bay Research Institute. Yeah. Yeah, there's some really cool stuff that comes off the ROVs, and then they have um, processed and, and described samples of, of sounds from the hydrophone, and they have lots of good stuff. 
Yeah, I just wish they made it like the the comment section or, or oh, you know what? It's back on. The comment section is actually it was disabled before, but it's back on. But I wish there was like someone you can uh, talk to for, uh, or would be oh, monitoring. Like consult his yeah, expert. or monitor this more. This well, they more need closely to put it on there's Twitch. so many questions about it. Yeah. They should put it on Twitch, and then you could comment, and then have some. That means they'd have to have someone there 24 someone hours. Someone have to sit there all the time. They could just yeah. make it like 8 a.m. Yeah. to 4 p.m. Yeah, because some yeah. days you hear sounds like it almost sounds like you know they have the hydrophone on a desk or something, and someone's moving it. And there's some like really mysterious sounds on there some days, yeah. or that weird clunking sound we kept on oh, hearing yeah. that other day. So it almost it's like, sounded like someone was like getting gear on and off their boat, or like, like banging a metal box or something. And it was yeah, like a clank on the side of the boat. Yeah, it was weird, and it only happened a couple times at different intervals we couldn't figure it out yeah but this has been something really fun for the well community out here to 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 enjoy yeah like i told you it will cause a lot of late night calls if some one person's <laughs> up to but, you know get on that hydrophone if i don't hear whales i just don't go whale watching <laughs> i just i wish it was like that easy though no oh, i don't because it, it, the, the the fun part is actually would, exploring yeah, because you never know the, what's going to come up that would take all the adventure out of it yeah another thing is yeah folks if, if we're hearing whales yeah, means we're hearing them, but it doesn't exactly mean they're. Yeah. It means they're close. So in in water, sound travels really well, uh, as I always say on the boat, because it has something to travel through. Uh, it's capable of traveling traveling a thousand times farther in water and four times faster. Why is that? Because the waves actually have something physical, the actual water uh, to travel through. So I kid you not, some of the whales we are hearing could literally be. Uh, you know, if the conditions are right, hundreds of miles away. So it doesn't mean they're actually over the hydrophone, but some days it just sure does uh, sound like they're over the hydrophone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, blue whales have been recorded communicating to each other across ocean, basin, ocean basins, um, and that's been proven with the hydrophone networks all over the um, oceans. But if you hear dolphins on the hydrophone, usually that means they're pretty close to where the hydrophone is. Their sound doesn't travel nearly as far. And you can hear them for a while sometimes. Like, yeah, yeah. You and know. you'll hear them fade out, too, as they move out of the area. <laughs> That's that, was, that was Slater, not the hydrophone. <laughs> Don't get excited. <laughs> beedo, beedo. That was a pretty good Pacific White-Sided impression. Killer, or the, the transients sound like crying mm -hmm. people. Yeah, it's a little scary. It's a little yeah, eerie. Yeah, it sounds like kind of scary, to be honest. Yeah. Rizzo's dolphins sound kind of creepy, too. They, like, make these really, like... Almost like in the horror movie when the door creaks open, they make yeah. those like creaking I don't know sounds. If I've heard yeah. yeah, a lot. I of, think I've heard a sound. A lot of our whales actually make some pretty creepy sounds, but uh, I think the ones that do usually aren't in the frequency we can hear. I know there was recently that footage released of minky whale uh, vocalizing. Oh, they sound like sounds like a spaceship. Yeah, <laughs> okay, yeah. the dwarf minky was, whale in the Antarctic. So there's that, the minky whale, and then what's the seal? The Waddell seal. The Waddell, the Waddell, the Waddell seal. Yeah, they sound Antarctica crazy. And I think even uh, bowheads, like, <laughs> yeah, bowheads can actually sound pretty unique yeah. uh, also. Oh. So if you guys are wondering what we're talking about, yeah, get on that uh, YouTube or any uh, other whale-related uh, website. You might be able to find some of these vocalizations out there. They're just, it's amazing. It doesn't sound like a sound that is coming out of our whales. So Yeah, the Weddell seal, Weddell, Weddell, Weddell seal. The first time I ever heard it, I honestly thought it was like the lead in to a Pink Floyd song. I was like, "What?" <laughs> I honestly thought happening? someone just did like a uh, like because it was a cute whale or a cute cute seal. I thought they just put like a little music like over it, was it or fake? something. Yeah, like it was just an <laughs> ambient sound or something. It was. It's weird. It's cool. And then it kind of echoes funny underneath the ice too when they're doing it. And so oh, it they do it underwater it too. You think? Even crazier. Yeah. The one I heard, he was just sitting on the ice. I'm sure they can't. Oh yeah, the underwater. underwater sounds are like. They sound like they're made by aliens. It's crazy. Maybe they are. <laughs> Maybe they are aliens. Maybe they've been aliens the whole time. They've been studying us. Uh, <laughs> you know what? I like this episode. Good. Ep episode 3 is a good one. Episode 3.1. Oh, yeah. Much improvement. The, the new and improved episode 3. <laughs> <laughs> well, should we end this right here? I think so. so now you have some homework of things to look up on the internet. Let yeah. us know what you think. Well, you guys, thank you so much if you made it this far. And thank you for listening to all the podcasts before this one and the one that got taken down if you did. <laughs> Hopefully we won't have any more um, hiccups like that. But we're learning and this is all new. But thank you so much for joining us. And if you guys don't follow us on Instagram, it's whale nerds. 
and uh, leave us comments or questions or anything you guys might like to hear on the podcast, and we'll try to bring them up in an episode. Thank you. We'll talk to you next time. All right. Thanks, everyone.